pleasure. Um, my name is Rosalie Sitman. I'm the head of the uh, Division of Languages at Tel Aviv University, and I was very honored to have been asked to uh, participate and, uh, and share this uh, session. Uh, from what I understand, uh, each speaker will have around 25 minutes, and then afterwards uh, we'll answer questions that we will collect. You know, each speaker will speak in its turn, in his, his her turn, and then at the end we'll collect um, the questions and uh, and have the, uh, the dialogue. So um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, open the session with a presentation by Uzi Baram, who is Professor of Anthropology at New College of Florida in the United States. Um, he has um, degrees in anthropology from the State University of New York at Binghamton and the University of Massachusetts, and has focused principally on historical archaeology in the eastern United States and the eastern Mediterranean. Um, among his publications are Typologies for Ottoman Tobacco Pipes, Critiques of Travel Accounts and Archaeology as Heritage, and he has co-edited co the volume entitled A Historical Archaeology of the Ottoman Empire, Breaking New Ground and Marketing Heritage, Archaeology and the Consumption of the Past, among many other works. His current research is the Archaeology of Freedom in 19th Century Florida. Uzi, the floor is yours. To Darabat, Darabat, Sarasota. Uh, not important. There was the attitude in the early 1990s when I asked about the archaeology of the recent past while in Israel. Historical archaeology was gaining traction in the United States, demonstrating a rich potential for addressing the issues of social change and recovering the voices of the voiceless. Firmly rooted in anthropology, the goal was to highlight people that we can group as a subaltern, those who did not enter the archival record under their own agency. First, the colonized, then expanded to the enslaved, women and members of the working classes. The argument was simple. Archaeology could recover and interpret what was left behind materially. Archaeological training and the analysis of material culture was revealing moments in history, reconstructing past lands, cultural landscapes and providing insights into broad social and cultural patterns. The timing of historical archeology span in the United States, the sustained arrival of Europeans in North America correlated with the conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean by the Ottoman Empire, both 500 years ago, but very different social dynamics, even as their material culture became intertwined over the modern age. This presentation suggests the archaeology for the subaltern of the Ottoman Empire, specifically peasants, offers insights into everyday life similar to what has been accomplished for North America, and that especially from Israel, the material history can challenge assumptions about colonialism and modernity in global perspective. Sorry, my uh, screen is not going, there we go. Like any archaeology, historical archaeology typically concentrates on specific sites. Examining sites and specific objects becomes the reasonable focus for an otherwise large-scale endeavor. I was trained in historical archaeology in New England, so when I joined the late 1980s archaeological survey at Ramat HaNadiv, I was interested in what was considered the top layers. Ramat HaNadiv on Mount Carmel between Zikr and Yaakov and Ben Yamina are gardens dedicated to the Baron Edmund de Rothschild and his wife Adelaide. The Baron purchased the property from Ifundi Huri, who organized a late 19th century farmstead. That building later served as a home for early 20th century Jewish immigrants. Previous to the farmstead, as recovered by excavations, was a peasant village. And before that, there were the ruins of a classical period villa and infrastructure. The sequence seemed clear. The classic age, an Ottoman period village, a modernizing farmstead, and Jewish immigrants, and finally gardens dedicated to the benefactor of Israel. Including the farmstead and excavating the village was unusual in its time. The result of Neil Silverman encouraging Yisar Hirschfeld to go beyond the Roman period ruins and consider the Ottoman period as part of the archaeological endeavor. Dr. Hirschfeld had published on the Palestinian Arab house as ethnoarchaeology, but the archaeology of Ramad Hanadib moved beyond that methodology. The excavation technique was similar to any in Israel, but the pottery of the peasants was a surprising challenge. There were few chronological indicators for the time period. 
there were very few comparative case studies within the region, and so the comparisons needed to be global. That has changed. I'm tempted to review the published, published literature and survey the archaeological projects, but that would be both too much for this presentation and not very informative. The need is a theoretical framework for change over the Ottoman centuries, a framework for the majority who are in the shadows of history. As in much of the world during the 16th, early 20th centuries, the majority of the population of the Ottoman Empire were peasants, but that changed in the last century. The how and why are significant for understanding the contemporary Middle East. Historical archeology span had case studies for the enslaved on plantations in the American South, yeoman farmers in New England, gender relations in industrializing uh, urban America, military bases in sub-Saharan coastal Africa and landscapes across Western Europe, but not many sustained publications on the Eastern Mediterranean. By focusing on the transformations of peasant daily life as on Mount Carmel, the trajectory and dynamics of history revealed by the new landscapes and the things that people used and left behind expose subaltern identities that haunt the present. The effort includes the politics of the past, recognizing the nuances for the history of the Ottoman Empire, incorporates studies of ceramics from excavations, and requires an active view of peasants. Uzi, can I interfere for a second? Yes. Do you want to maybe to enlarge the presentation so we see the, the specific oh, slide? You're not seeing the slides. We, yeah. we are seeing the slide, but we're seeing all of them and not... Uh, oh my so goodness, okay. I'm, I'm yeah. glad you saw something. Yeah. So I'm seeing on my screen... No, go up on the slideshow. Go up the slideshow. To the right. From beginning. There you go. That better? <laughs> yes. Great. I appreciate you, Val, you, you, you interrupting me. That would have been terrible for <laughs> going the whole 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> There's you have going to, to be thank some good ceramics for, for the archaeologists to look at. So yeah. I want to make sure you all get to see them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ah, it's back to the presentation. Uh, the insights from archaeology are significant in order to confront continuing colonial images of the Ottoman Empire and its peasants. For instance, the American John Lloyd Stevens traveled to Egypt in 1836 and published his travel account the next year. One passage illustrates the assumptions by this traveler, quote, like the ruined and deserted village we, we had left. It was a mingled exhibit of ancient greatness and modern poverty. The rude artisans of the present day knew nothing of the works which their predecessors had built, and the only care they had for them was to pull them down, unquote. This theme of decline from classical splendor in travel accounts is repeated so often that Edward Said recon reconceptualized Orientalism from its critique. But it's not just an issue of Westerners. The Ottoman archives also tell the peasants of Palestine. Studies of those archives recognize what the American political scientist, anthropologist James C. Scott, who's been mentioned several times already in this conference, calls seeing like a state. The central government, as with all states, focus on resource extraction, listings of villages and population numbers were the focus of government officials and they, listed, they were listed to be, taxed to, to be taxed and have no voice in the representation. While it's reasonable to expect better information as we get closer to the present, the dynamics of empire led to the opposite. For the Ottoman Empire, the inequalities of representation accelerate over the 19th century. Historians recognize the irony of the Ottoman Land Code of 1858 as encouraging modernization of agriculture and peasants becoming workers for estates as the lands became registered under absentee landlords. The village at Ramadha Nadiv exemplifies that trajectory. The modern transformation of the landscapes set the stage for the more dramatic changes of the British mandate and emergence of the state of Israel. Recovering that information requires confronting Orientalism and governmentality. For the archaeology of the modern age, the scholarly discussion appropriately start, started with a political stance. To say that archaeology is intertwined with politics is nothing new, but needs to be acknowledged. The history of archaeology and what is commonly known as the Holy Land gains momentum during the period the Ottoman Empire ruled the land. Archaeologists were seeking biblical antiquity and the classic period. The world around the Western European and North American archaeologists were rarely of interest except for ethno-archaeology or as negative comparisons to antiquity. During the British Mandate, 
hallmarks of the Ottoman Empire were erased or reinterpreted. The landscape transformed even more with struggles from independent nation states. For example, the clock towers of the region, built as modernist statements to honor Abu Hamid, were either removed or under the state of Israel made into a temporal heritage. We see that playing out for modernizing agricultural fields becoming a nature preserve at Ramat Hanadiv as well. The muffling of the Ottoman past was ideological, an attempt to connect a nationalist future to a deeper past. The possibilities for piercing the ideology came with historical archaeology. In 1985, Albert Locke, an American teaching at Bear Zayt, published a comparison of American and Middle Eastern archaeologies and called for stressing archaeology's anthropology and expanding on the relationship between texts and material culture. The anti-imperialism of the article showcased the political nature of the endeavor. Neil Silverman, in his 1989 essays in Between Past and Present, used keen observations to offer the politics of archaeology. And that facilitated exceptions. Radha Zadaya explored the Ottoman layers for Tel Tanakh to reveal the continuing use of abandoned houses and the dynamics of the region, which were misinterpreted by 19th century travel accounts and muffled by Ottoman archival sources. Rather than a simple story of peasants as victim of imperial rule and modernization, the archaeological research looks beneath the surface. And the evidence of change is fascinatingly complex. The great historian of the region, Albert Harari, wrote of the 19th and 20th centuries that, quote, all divisions of the continuum of historical time are bound to some extent to be arbitrary. But the changes which have taken place in the Middle East as in the rest of the world during the last two centuries have been so great and have gone so deep that they can be regarded as forming a new and distinctive period in the history of the world, unquote. Memories of those changes, though, have faced the post-World War I upheavals and partitions and now accelerating urbanization. In a 1993 volume, Struggle and Survival in the Modern Middle East, the life histories for peasants over the 20th century illustrate an important point. That way of life is gone and nearly forgotten, and the amnesia and misrepresentations are not helpful for understanding the emergence of the contemporary world. It is worth stepping back and considering the general image of the peasant as so many have done already at this conference. And I'll start with Karl Marx. In 1852, the 18th Bermide of Louis Napoleon wrote of the small holding peasants of France, quote, the great mass of the French nation is formed by the simple addition of magnitudes, such as potatoes in the sack form a sack of potatoes, unquote. That assumption that there's little to consider for the peasantry continues to be an intellectual legacy. And an alternative view comes from James C. Scott, who explored the agency and practices of peasants to expose important dynamics of everyday resistance, showing the centrality of agricultural production and the friction of, of terrain as facets of peasant life that prevents state control. And being hard to control, it turns out, was an important technique. When necessary, the peasants revolted against imperial rule. Understanding the basis for the revolts come from the everyday facets of change available via archeology span in conjunction with research on the archival sources. How to put them together to recognize the full humanity of Ottoman peasants can benefit from the lessons of historical archeology. span Those lessons include stressing the ambiguities between the documentary and material records. After decades of research, especially in the United States, fine-grained studies of households, urban neighborhoods, rural areas, and change are successfully offering new perspectives on the near past. Where the insights into the development of racial separations in Annapolis, Maryland, or gender inequalities in the industrial city of Lowell, or the insights into freedom from enslavement on Southern plantations, or legacies of health inequalities in Western Pennsylvania, Theoretical, theoretical framing from critical theory, black feminism and anarchism have illuminated power dynamics and opportunities from studies of material culture. The efforts growing out of Boazian anthropology is anti-racist, recognizing the full personhoods of pe people of lives, even if they are in the shadows of the documentary record. The first steps towards realizing that framework, and apologies for my Siamese cat, who clearly has a lot of interest in black feminist thoughts and has to jump in. 
he does this during my, when I teach as well. Uh, the first steps towards realizing that framework requires situating objects in chronological order, locating their production centers and distribution networks, and exploring the meaning of things. Here in this presentation, I'll focus on that third part, the social mean aspects of archeology. span Starting with the commodity and not the fragments recovered by excavations, the use of tobacco is one of the best examples of how the peoples of the Ottoman Empire became entangled with the world system. The new sociability facilitated by the drug food, as Eric Wolf called it, spread rapidly after tobacco became introduced across Europe, Africa, and Asia. The omnipresence of tobacco pipe fragments make them a mark of the post-Columbian world. And the type, while different from Western European Kalin tobacco pipes, break as readily and thus enter the material record in large numbers for archaeologists, archaeologists to analyze chronological and stylistic variation. A similar drug food has its origins in the region. Coffee expanded the market for Chinese porcelains. The sociability of coffee increased consumption of tiny cups. The coffee house, a new social place, develops in the Ottoman Empire and spreads into Western Europe and beyond and has ceramic correlates. The presence of British mass-produced ceramics, which emulated those porcelains, is a material feature connecting directly with historical archaeology in North America and beyond. Archaeological studies of consumption of such goods focus on the nuanced changes in ceramics from creamware to pearlware to whitewares and the implications for social status to comparisons of particular locations and households. These goods are found in the cities and villages of the Eastern Mediterranean, but their use is not simply the replacement of local traditions with uh, foreign goods. The Ottoman ceramic industries, as Linda Carroll explained, continue to compete with Chinese and British ceramics. And there are regional industries as well, with Gazaware being the most famous of the finds from the recent past. Different plates lead us to food ways and the transformations as new commodities entered markets and new crops planted in fields. Maroom exposes the eating habits, the divide between sharing and individualism and dishware through a case study from Greece. But unlike the extent and depth of studies in North America, Ottoman archeological studies of ceramics are descriptive and offer chronological change, but not comparisons among households, villages, and other locales yet. A focus on household consumption, which obviously I'm advocating for, gets us into the homes of peasants, into the intimate places where families are reproduced and traditions created. The near past of these households matter because of heritage. That bundle of processes that David Lowenthal opened up as an academic pursuit, catching up with the explosive growth and in interest in the past for the present, the simplest definition of heritage. These politics of the past are important from historical archaeology. Recently, Ruth Young took the framework further and offers a regional perspective from Oman and Iran. Neither were part of the Ottoman Empire, but the, free, the theoretical framework is relevant. For Ruth Young, studying abandoned rural mud brick villages in Oman and landlord villages in Iran is historical archaeology for people to connect directly with their recent past, a past relevant to their own histories and experiences and rooted in place. That focus on houses brings us back to architecture, but without losing the possibilities of ethno-archaeological analogies, offers a keen sense of the social meaning for places rooted in the recent past. The archaeological record of Israel has one of the richest potentials in the region for such studies, especially now that excavations commonly include the top layers. The care given to stratigraphic control means that the archaeology of the Ottoman period peasantry can help break the binary between passive and rebellious masses, reinterpreting the incorporation of global commodities into daily life as resistance to the established social order and helping the present remember the empirical aspects of the lives of the majority. Exposing the differences among peasants and between different peasant villages and across different time periods for the assemblages of modern commodities com comes from careful study and comparisons, allowing the changing landscape to come into focus. For the peasantry of Palestine, 
no one should be surprised that politics flows through the recovery and documentation, analysis, and interpretation, and representation and dissemination of archaeological insights. The survey of a village by Jerusalem exemplifies those dynamics. The documentation confronts the divide between development and preservation, between commemoration and remembering village life, between local values and global interests. When I was told decades ago that the Ottoman layers in the archaeological stratigraphy were not important, that was an ideological statement and not a scientific one. And luckily, the expansion of archaeological interest has and will continue to grow as more case studies become available for comparisons. In conclusion, archaeological evidence and conversation with archival resources provides an ambiguous and multi-layered view of the emergence of modernity in Palestine. The material evidence and reconstruction of cultural landscapes offer complex rather than simplified representations of the majority, allowing historic perspective on the decisions, agency, and trajectories that continue to haunt the region. As American anthropologists commonly state, we need to listen carefully to hear the voices and concerns of the subaltern. And as Jim Dietz wrote long ago, in the small things forgotten, we find the evidence of lives lived and social change. Thank you for listening and apologies for my cat's interjections. Thank you very, very much, Izzy, for an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, certainly a great start to, uh, to this session devoted to material culture and the study of societies in the near past. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Beatrice Saint Laurent. Uh, who received her PhD in Islamic art at Harvard University and was a student of Oleg Grabar. Her doctoral thesis, Ottomanization and Modernization, the Architecture and Urban Development of Bursa and the Genesis of Tradition, 1839-1914, focused on the late Ottoman period of the first Ottoman capital. Uh, Beatrice is Professor of Art History in the Department of Art and Art History at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Bridgewater State University. She has been involved in research on the restoration of the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque for 30 years, with many book chapters and articles on the subject, um, including the Dome of the Rock, Restorations and Significance, 1540-1918, um, by, edited by Ottoman Jerusalem. Uh, the, uh, oh, sorry, Ottoman Jerusalem, edit, uh, editors S. Bold and R. Hillebrand, published in 2000. Um, she, in collaboration with her now deceased colleague, Ism Awad, former chief architect and conservator of the Haram al-Sharif, are currently completing a book on 7th century Jerusalem entitled Capitalizing Jerusalem, Muavaya, this urban vision, I apologize for my um, bad pronunciation, this is unfamiliar to me, um, as well as another book on the 20th and 21st century restorations of the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Beatrice, thank you. I have to say I have lost you. Hello? Beatrice, can you unmute Beatrice? yourself? Can you, can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Okay, we can hear you. But I'm lost, but I don't see the PowerPoint. I don't see the Zoom meeting on the screen any longer. Let me, yeah, I may need to rejoin the meeting. We see your presentation. We see my presentation. That's yeah. all I care. That's all I care. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you can see and hear me. The yes. joys of uh, the joys of uh, Zoom. I don't have my, I don't have a cat to introduce you to. <laughs> but I'd first like I'd like to start by saying thank you to the conference organizers for this multidisciplinary con conference uh, and including me as a presenter. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm uh, the one who probably differs the most in what I'm going to present today because I'm not focusing on the peasantry, but rather I'm focusing on a particularly important monument that is uh, affected by uh, current and past politics in, in its definition. Um, much of what we rely on in our everyday observation of a monument that has become a symbol of so much to so many 
as the Dome of the Rock has, emphasizes its current visual condition as representative of its past and the role it plays in today's charged political environment. My role is to deconstruct what we have come to see as, a visually, norm as visually normative about the structure as well as its political context through history. Though I'm not attempting to accomplish its political deconstruction today, that's more to be done in my books. I'm, uh, my training is as an art historian of Islamic art with a focus on the late 19th century and early 20th century Ottoman period in Turkey. And I came to Jerusalem late uh, in, my, in my work. But uh, what I have, and for the past 30 years, I've been working pretty much under the radar on the Dome of the Rock and other Islamic monuments of the Haram al-Sharif and their transformation through history. That's been in uh, complete conjunction with my now deceased co-author, collaborator and friend, Isam Awad, who was the chief architect and conservator of the Haram for 32 years, to the point where most people didn't know what we were working on at all. I had total access to necessary documents to complete our research, and now I'm trying to bring that research to publication. There are two books to bring out, one on the seventh century, which seems an, an odd place for a late Ottomanist to be functioning, and the other is on the 20th and 21st century restorations of the dome in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which will follow. Um, here's my little arrows. Uh-oh, not letting me proceed to my next slide. Okay. Um, today I'm gonna focus, the, the title of my talk is probably more aptly, um, titled the Mos uh, Tiles, Mosaics, Beams, and Spolia, which I'm going to try and touch a little bit of everything today uh, and, and try to deal with the, um, the consequences of what is revealed in the 1961 um, renovation project of the Dome of the Rock, which began as a British-inspired restoration turned over to um, the Egyptians by the Jordanians who sponsored the restoration and it's a very interesting one to see the politics of that which will not be demonstrated today but uh, you might find it interesting to know that it was the whole project was executed by an Egyptian team appointed by the Jordanians uh, and they were relying on the Saudi millionaire Mohammed bin Laden's construction company which is uh, an interesting detail that many people don't know and will, this will all be published with documentation. For the visual representation, I think you can see the difference in what's going on in the two images on the screen. You see the, the pre-1961 condition of the dome in 1954 and you see it in process. Uh, moving on to the building itself, uh, what I'm gonna focus on with the tiles is, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna focus on this particular part of the structure, which is the, uh, the Quranic inscription that was inscribed, uh, uh, which was put on the building, along with the tiles uh, first placed on the building in the mid 16th century by Solomon, by Solomon, Suleiman the Magnificent in his equating himself with the Solomonic references to this site. This I've written about in the past and as have other people. Um, I see it more as, le as less an imposition of a power statement uh, rather than an equation and relationship to the monument itself, um, though it has been interpreted as a power statement of sovereignty of the Ottomans over the site. I tend to view these things in a very different context, and you will see that in the spolia section. Um, Traditionally, we have viewed the tiles uh, on the building within the framework established by Richmond in his typology established in 1918 and published in 1924. This is a, a slide of the um, typology as displayed in the Islamic Museum on the Haram al-Sharif, although I have to say that the panel of the Quranic inscription was taken down during my work on that project in 2008-2009. Um, um, let's see what's next. I need to move something on the other screen so I can see what's coming. Uh, visually, we have a problem with understanding what the building looked like pre-19, 
pre-1961 because we're so accustomed to seeing the tiles that are there now. I'm showing you two images, one 1924-25 uh, autochrome showing the actual probably closer to the color of the structure compared to the 19, to a 1954 image, which really tells you not to rely on imagery <laughs> uh, uh, scientifically. But um, I'm sh this is the part of the picture I'm showing you. And these are very late 19th, early 20th century tiles applied to the building. And what has happened to a lot of these, um, these, these, these tiles, which were completely removed from the building in 1961 and replaced with new tiles in 1961. Uh, I thought you might find it interesting to see what happened. Um, I think if I show you this and show you that it came from here, it tells you that the slide survived. This is my first visit back to, the, to Jerusalem in 2007 and spending some time finding the tiles uh, that remain in storage in the museum. And you can see that some of the ones from this time period do survive. What has happened to some of them uh, is also interesting. This part uh, with the arrow pointing to it has become a coffee table that lives in the Ecole Biblique. Um, and, and, and the priests were very uh, accommodating and providing me with images and sizes, et cetera. And I think this coffee table figured in an exhibition at the Rockefeller last year. But that's not really where my focus is today. This is what the building looks like today and that same spot. And, and this is what it was back then. Um, this, this is the Surat al-Isra inscription, which um, was replaced in 1961. So what you're looking at is 1960s slides or images, uh, tiles, and that is basically what remains on the building today, except for the inscriptions, which are older. They did not remove the inscriptions and replace them, unlike the mosaics on the interior. Oh, you don't want to change. Okay, let's try doing it this way. All right. Uh, just a closer view to show you what they what they do look like today. Um, lots of images from the art historian. That's what you're going to get today. You're not going to get lots of historical text. This is how I found the tiles in 2007. Stood in an outdoor courtyard, the remains from the 61 um, um, renovation. This is where they ended up being placed the ones that were not lost and taken away from the site. Whoops, sorry, that's not what's supposed to be happening. And the tiles that I am working on with the, um, with the inscription are back here with a water hose on them. And you can see that here. And we started by placing them out here, the director of the museum and I started by placing them outside. And then we started realizing that there was an organization to them and you can see this older tile with the number on the back and this will figure quickly in my discussion. We brought them inside and here you're seeing the direct, the former director of the museum, Khadr Salame, uh, taking accountability of these before we started spreading them on the floor. We spread them all out on the floor. Remember now, see how dark it is in there. It was January in 2009 no heat, no electricity in the building. <laughs> so my images are not as clear as they could be. Um, we set out the, inscri the inscriptions and matched them up and tried to identify what was going on. And everybody says that all of these tiles are from the 16th century, but uh, they're not. I have, a ca I have a catalog of images that, will, uh, that I can use to study these. I took a picture of every every um, tile with the, the reverse on it. So there is um, fodder for work. These are uh, one tile type where you have them pretty much in good shape. And on the back, uh, we have written numbers. And then we have these uh, with the inscribed numbers in the clay, which should have given us a clue immediately as to what was going on. And you can see that the, uh, where the white was are depressions and that does not appear, uh, the, the white glaze needed to be set into the clay itself. And that kind of depression does not appear in the other tile type. 
And um, Khadr set about um, identifying the parts of the inscription. And one of the things that quickly came to light is that we had repetitive uh, parts of the inscription. So we realized that we had two time periods of tiles. So not just 16th century tiles. Look to the monument for that is, is basically what I'm saying. You, you discover more about the monument by examining the monument than by looking at the text, but using the text to relate to them. This is the one type, the, the type that um, indeed um, has the non-inscribed numbers. And here's the type with the, uh, with the inscribed numbers on the back. Um, these are the ones that are 16th century. All of the others date from an 1874 restoration of the building under Abdul Aziz. So even with, with the remnants that we have where everybody is saying they're all 16th century, they certainly are not. And it took extensive examination of the inscription and putting it back together to find out that we had repetitions. And here we have the 1961 version of it with, you know, completely, um, completely done and redone and put on building in 1961. Okay, so I'm going to move on to mosaics and you'll see why it, I did the tiles first in, in a few minutes. I'm showing you the Dome of the Rock from 1924 to 25 and I've included the Dome of the Chain, which was built contemporaneously in the seventh century. And I um, mean, I'm currently working on redating the uh, construction and ascribing the early construction of this building, as you've all knows, to Muawiyah as opposed to Abd al Malik. And that is our seventh century book. And that is what is to be proven through that, where we have very few document, documentary information, very little documentary information, but uh, in fact, the monument speaks for itself in that context, both physically and archeologically. And we see here, and I'll, I've, I've been allowed access to incredible documentary information, uh, amongst them a 2,500 body of uh, body politic of photographs from the Aukaf or archives in Jerusalem, which were rescued uh, by Islam from destruction. And this is the documentation from the 1961 restoration. And I'm pointing to this guy that's standing up on the scaffolding because he's going to indicate a couple of things to us, both the beam construction and what remains of what's under the tiles. The building outside was covered with mosaics and he's, uh, he's pointing to those mosaics up here and um, and I'll show you more. You can see the bits and pieces that survive from here. This is the piece that's there. Um, no one really has discussed this in any great historical context because nobody has ascribed a reason for its existence. Because most scholars um, say that the building uh, mimicked Byzantine buildings of the time period. Well, there is no Byzantine building that has mosaics on the exterior. Uh, what we are proving is that this comes from influence from Yemen, which I'm not going to go into now, but um, will come out in the book that is soon to be published in 2021, as soon as I finish the last chapter uh, over break. Uh, but there's a, mu a much more adequate explanation as to why the building on the exterior was colorful, um, both to mimic the temple and to mimic a palace type that existed in Yemen, the uh, surviving pre-Islamic palace of the Sabian kings. And we'll see more. And this is a fragment amongst many, amongst a few that exist still in the museum of that exterior mosaic decoration that they preserved when they took off the tiles. Um, I'm showing you a little snippet in the upper left-hand corner. I hope you can all see it in these little, in, in the pictures. But this is uh, from Sasanian Ctesiphon. And um, Sasanian Ctesiphon had um, exterior, exterior um, mosaic decoration. And uh, it is very close in form to that uh, of the exterior of the Dome of the Rock of the early period, seventh century application of these. These mosaics survived well into the 16th century 
at least the remnants of them, before Suleiman uh, removed them and uh, recovered them with the tiles. Um, I have to thank Stephen Fine for pointing out this issue with Ctesiphon. And this is a, uh, a sliver of, of the, of the Ctesiphon mosaic that survives in the, the museum, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. All right, there are two types that show up on the building and we have some that show up on the lower areas of the dome under the windows. And these are of a, dif a different type, in fact, and are, can be related to a later period of restoration. The, um, the, the mosaics are ten tend to be framed in these black contours, which are significantly different than the earlier mosaics and do not have the swirly effect of the other mosaics. And this I've dealt with in an article for a conference that took place in 2016 in Jericho on the mosaics. And I've listed, I've, whoa, I've listed, oh my, I'm sorry, this is not supposed to be happening. Um, I've listed some of those publications in the final slide of this presentation, which is being recorded so you can have access to it. And I'm showing you this because um, I'm going back to the, to the dome because I want you to see something else. Behind this whole band revealed in the 61 restoration is this. There were arches that were open at the time so that on the other side, there probably were mosaics. It's not to say that that inscription didn't exist somewhere in mosaic, but we don't know if it did or not. That inscription could then have been uh, imposed on the building by the Ottomans, which is a very different statement. Here's the, another part of it, and you can see, see them both here. And uh, what the previous slide showed is that this is no longer, no, it's no longer visible because what they've done is they've cemented over it and it's not too visible in this image, sorry to say. Parallel mosaics exist in the dome of the chain um, and they will be, um, I'll show them to you. They appear, and these are windows. Mm. And on all sides, you have the soffits of the windows decorated with the mosaics. And I have to thank uh, Yuval Baruch for his images of those mosaics because mine really are awful. And they came with the, um, and this is where they appear. And that's my image from the Aukaf archives. So, the, but these all date from the Mamluk period, which are parallel to the ones under the windows. And that's the illustration of that. Now on to the beams. I'm gonna do this quickly. We have wooden beams and rafters that have all been dismantled and taken away from the supports above the arcade. And that's one in, that I found in the trash in 2009. It has since disappeared. And here we have them replaced with aluminum. And we have the beams here. And that same guy is up there pointing to the beams. And those beams all are placed very specifically so that the decorated ends appear. I don't know if these beams are in reuse from churches. I still haven't figured that out or if they were actually created for the building, but every beam has a, di a, a distinct unit of decoration that is meant to be viewed from below and therefore they were exposed in the early period of, this, of the structure. And here they are. And here's, a nut, here's two of them showing you the placement and how they appeared. And on the inside, we have um, a couple of Abbasid inscriptions from the period of Abbasid restoration of the building, transcribed by Magaw. Um, and I'm going to move quickly to spolia. And my view of spolia is very different than what um, is often expressed. I think there's two ways that spolia are used. One as, ru in, in, as ruins and just built into the structure and others used to display the past. And I'm viewing this in the context of what I'm saying is the beginning of the museum concept in Islam in the seventh century. Here we have the columns of the interior of the Dome of the Rock is amongst one of the things that figures in that definition um, of 
the historic display. Why would you just be using it as ruins if you're gonna put it so prominently around the rock? There's gotta be another explanation. And I'm, there's a whole chapter in our first book on this whole use of spolia. And here's the interior of the dome again. I also am a scholar of photography and do teach the history of photography. So you'll see my reliance. On the exterior, you, you have on the, on the Northeast facing facade, you have the placement of this Byzantine chancel screen. And everybody says, oh, what horror. Well, no, it's centrally placed, intended to be viewed as a display of the past in my view of how the spolia is being used. And I do think I'm not the only one who's revising views on the use of spolia. Also happens in the Dome of the Chain. And um, we can see that all, <clears throat> the mouse is giving me grief, sorry. Uh, we can see that the, let's hope it doesn't change it on me. Okay, I want to use my mouse. All of the columns in the Dome of the Chain, and if, if some of you may have noted that some of my pictures show tiles on the outside and that's period specific. I've been taking pictures of these buildings since 1990 and they've undergone a lot of change. A lot of change. And I wanna show you one particular column in, in, on the inside, which is that one that the arrow is pointing toward. Previous slide was taken in 2012, this one in 2016, when they had uh, completely replaced all of the tiles of the Dome of the Chain with modern ones, uh, contemporary, produced in Jerusalem. And what we have is a column with the bar of what was originally a cross, the cross bar having been removed. Um, so that we can see that integrated in these two seventh century structures, probably built initiation of the construction at the same time, though I can't say I've spent a lot of energy working on the dome of the chain at the moment. I do believe that it probably served as the treasury. And that is from descriptions uh, that, I, that we have found in early texts. But we will, and the building has obviously been much modified uh, in the course of history. But what we see today, and this is the visual representation that we have all come to rely on, and this is obviously from 2012, the Dome of the Chain tiles are not on there yet. And uh, the covering of the dome, as you all well know, was, was done in 1993. And I had the good fortune to be standing on top of that building during that time period, documenting the entire, um, restoration of the dome uh, and its reconsideration. Um, it's, it, this was a journey which will be also included in the, uh, the book on the 20th and 21st century. But this is the building that we've come to admire. The building initially in, this, in the seventh century did have a gold colored dome, which was probably copper and because the words can be interchangeably used or brass, um, depending on the word used. So one has to be very careful in ascribing uh, the time periods. I can also say that my work on the Ottoman restorations of this building, and that is in the book on Ottoman Jerusalem, did document the work of peasants on the site down to the provision of grapes and coffee and the amount it cost to provide that. I did work in the sigil archives, which were then stored in one of the madrasas of the Haram Sharif. And I'm going to conclude there, and I did make it through my 50 slides. And I, I hope I didn't go too fast, but I did want to manage to complete all of it on time. And I did, <laughs> 50 seconds to go. <laughs> Thank, so you very, you. Very, Thank you very much, Beatrice. That really was excellent uh, timing and uh, most interesting uh, presentation, beautiful uh, slides. Um, our next speaker needs no introduction, Professor Yuval Gadot. He is the head of the Department of Archaeology and uh, Ancient Near Eastern Cultures here at Tel Aviv University. Yuval is an archaeologist dealing with the Bronze and Iron Ages, the second and first millennium BCE. He has excavated at sites such as Ramat Rachel, Azekah, and in the last year's Jerusalem. 
um, Yuval holds a long-term study of the rural landscape of Jerusalem. This has brought him to join forces with Amos Nadan and initiate a project that, that looks at villages from recent history that are located close to Jerusalem in the hope of gaining insights into the social and economic mechanism of village life. In his presentation today, he will attempt to present one such lesson. Yuval. If you, if you yeah, yeah. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for all the other speakers. And anyway, before I begin, I wish to, to first thank many students who contributed to the creation of uh, this paper, paper, which I'm about to share with you. Farmers' modes of, modes of integration and in general, and Kalunia specifically, stood at the heart of the seminar Dr. Amos Nadan and I taught for the last two years. The fruits of this seminar were numerous papers submitted by the students that utilized primary sources, and Uzi was mentioning these ideas of primary sources, uh, uh, be they maps, archival documents, and archaeological findings in order to document actual expressions of social and economic integration or disintegration, as I will show today. Our session tomorrow morning will share some of the results <coughs> in Hebrew, and we hope that some of these papers will also be published soon. In any case, I wish to thank all of these students, some of them are here, uh, for their contribution, and I will manage, uh, mention also some of them by names along the road. So why integration? Tax documentation left by, left by the British administration from the first part of the 20th century relate to a village as the basic economic unit. And I think we heard it today. For example, the tax record of Kalunia from 19, uh, 1945 state that the village is said to have legal rights over 4,800 dunams of land and go on to describe how many dunams were used for orchards, how many for grain cultivations and how many were left uncultivated during that year. More specific legal reg registrations show that the land was owned or at least registered under the name of a number of individuals as a kind of shareholders, an aspect I will come back to later on in my talk. But it's rarely the individual or the nuclear family that stands at the focus. In the clear, it is clear that the population living in Kalunia were not mere neighbors that happened to buy houses one next to each other, like an American typical suburban town. Rather, they were part of a living organ that had to cooperate, share, and exchange in order to exist. Hence, interact in integration is a requirement for village life and not a luxury. But how is integration achieved and how is it generated down to, to, through the generations? Is it merely a legal aspect as, as it is in Western societies today or does it rely on forming social ties that serves to bond people together? I'm not an economist, I'm coming from archeology span so I turn to the anthropologist as, as a, a, a kind of a theoretical background and the early 20th century uh, sociologist Marcel Moss describes societies as total phenomena. He urges us, academics, not to fragment society into specialized aspects, economy, society, religion, and so on. Instead, we need to understand that these aspects are all intertwined and should be studied as one holistic whole. It's a mission we as academics operating in the world that is fragmented into departments and disciplines find very hard to do. But grouping together and conducting interdisciplinary research may lead us to realize how family ties, ceremonies, and joint ownership of economic assets such as land are all different aspects of one phenomenon, village integration. Furthermore, as I will try to demonstrate, it's not only us who find it hard to look at different aspects as related uh, and intertwined. It is also the administrators of the British Empire who brought with them a Western economic approach based on fragmentation and what they call rationality, or maybe we can call it a West, Western position, that had not really realized that advocating for modernizing, uh, in their view, or Westernizing the economy will place pressure on other aspects of life in a rural society. The Palestinian village of Kalunia was chosen for this research. The, the village is situated near Wadi Tulma on the upper research, uh, reaches of the Sawai Creek Basin, about six kilometers west of Jerusalem's old city. Today it's really at the outskirts of the city. 
The village was destroyed during the 1948 war and the actual houses were demolished in the years that followed. The location of the village close to Jerusalem and next to an important thoroughfare, combined with the concentration of several springs and fertile soil, were crucial factors in the location of the village and in, in, in this region throughout thousands of years. Interestingly, and contrary to its location in earlier periods, during the 19th and 20th century, the village center was located on the upper third of a slope inclining southward towards the creek at some distance from the historical Jaffa Jerusalem Road, as well as from the springs. When planning this research, we designed it to have a bottom-up approach. We wanted a place that has enough primary sources that will enable us to build our cases from the actual evidences and not from the find and uh, from the actual and not find ourselves locked within concepts that were developed by scholars like us who were who thought they know what will be rational for the villagers uh, to do. More specifically, we wanted to pass external sources like village statistics that we all turn to that report on the village from the outside and to reach first hand sources. By that I mean things that were written by people living in the studied village. But here comes the title of the conference, the study of the illiterate segment of society in the recent past. So we are not really dealing with a society that wrote. So a second option, just like Uzi has uh, 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 suggested, is to look at things they, they produced and used and discarded. And that is where archeology span comes to play. I know that not everyone here finds it this last sentence natural. After all, archaeology is done by people that are external to the village, and when it comes to Israel, by Israelis or Americans, who are at best not part of the cultural, cultural being studied. But those of us who, are, who practice archaeology realize that material culture is a language, and that the way artifacts were styled or used convey messages from one sector of society to another. To be clear, these messages were not addressed to us, future generations or the archaeologists. No, when we find objects that were last used in the past, we are actually tapping into a conversation that, that, were, uh, uh, that went, went on while these objects were in use. In some cases, these conversations delivered messages that were never articulated in words. Expressions of values, expressions of resistance, of identity, are always embedded in the way we shape our world and the way we shaped our artifacts. This is why doing archaeology in a historical documented period is so valuable. As the scholar listed in the slide and many others, including uh, uh, the distinguished speaker at the beginning of the session and all others before me, argued, uh, argued in writing, the contribution of archaeology to the study of the recent past does not lay in our ability to serve as a kind of a ground, ground proofing of historical known facts, or that we can show that an earthquake believed to have happened in one year actually happened in a, in a different year. This is nice, but this is not enough. The value of studying material culture is because it's allow it allows us to hear voices of the past that have not found their way into writing. This trail can lead us to two different directions. One that can we can give uh, one is that we can give voices to segments of society uh, that had not access to and had no access to historical documentation, and there are many examples like that. And I cannot hear like uh, the one of the African Americans community using archaeology to express their uh, history. And this is taken from Philadelphia, where the uh, Freedom Bell is located. A second direction is to compare between what we say we say about ourselves and what our values are, and how we actually act and behave. There is almost always a gap between the ideal and the real, and this gap should not be approached with cynicism. Sometimes this gap is formed because things are gradually changing and while our concept of reality tells us one thing, a slow undercurrent has already took our lives in a very different direction. In the moment that I have left, when we're going, going to come concentrate on Kalunia, I will hopefully demonstrate this gap and its meaning through our interdisciplinary study of the village in the 19th and 20th century and the role of social and economic integration. This study sits in between the two tracks I mentioned above. While the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of the peasants were illiterate and there is no sing, not a single book written by a Falakh during the British mandate period, Colonia is somewhat of an exception. There was a school at the village and therefore literate residents. 
three educated residents of the village wrote memories that belong to a genre known as the Nakba Memorial Books. These are memoirs uh, typical of a collective biographies written by village descendants far removed in time from the War of 1948. They include personal and family recollections together with summaries of documents and interviews. Out of the three published books, the one written by Muhammad Aleb Samarin, and I uh, apologize now for my ability to pronounce Arabic names, uh, and published in 2003, hold extensive information regarding the topic that is the focus of this study, and thus in today's lectures, and also tomorrow, he will be quoted most frequently. So we are, we are using written sources, which means it's not exactly voicing the voicelessness, but these documents were written in retrospect, and like any other kind of sources should not be taken in its face value. We are completely aware of the shortcomings of this kind of writing as they reflect his personal place in the village and that of his family, also the status, the status of a Palestinian refugee writing for future generations should not be ignored. And this is where the second trail comes into play. Using material culture, we note some interesting gaps within the finds and the written and oral doc descriptions. These gaps are not mere bad memory or on behalf of the author or personal agenda. Rather, as we will try to argue, they reveal the effects of Western economic social values a head on the former structure of the village, a structure bonded together by integration. When Muhammad Raleb Samarin sat down to and wrote his memoirs of the village, he placed two social economic institutes at the center, the clan and the house. These aspects will be dealt in more details in tomorrow's lecture by Do Wechtel and Eli Ayalon, and I will summarize here some of their finds. It is clear from, from his writing, Muhammad Samarin, of course, that the village of Kalunia consisted of four major clans, Hitab, El Galeat, Abu Saad, and Mashal. Sumarin so usually defines the village's four clans as families and its subclan as Hamulas. These were followed by additional subordinate sub-subclans, unit named Dal, literally meaning house. However, in another book about Kalunia, written by uh, Otman Hassan, the four major clans are called Hamulas with mixed terminology used for the subordinate clans. All this means that we should be careful with the terminology we use, but the power of the family as a principal ordering factor cannot be underestimated. It should be noted that we are dealing here with a metaphor of the clan and family. It does not matter for our case, whether there was a real biological connection between members of the clan. What matters is that the alliance was built on their perception of family ties and that this is what Sumurin and his generation saw as fundamental structure of the village. One expression, expression of this ordering principle is the spatial distribution of the four clans. According to Sumurin, the village geographical layout was divided into four defined sectors, East, Central Kalunia, North, Upper Kalunia, West and South. The village's main road are the ones forming the borders between the four sectors. Sumarin's memoir emphasized that the four major clans cluster next to each other and in a way inhabited the four different sectors. I say in a way because the southern sector is in fact alien to the village and inhabited a, a affluent families and very st strong political families from Jerusalem. So if we follow Sumarin and the others, the four clans clustered within the three sectors and the organizing principle of the village was that of, that of the extended family. A comparison of their cartographic sources like this 1945, uh, 1945 British map reveals that the, vil the village's built up area was indeed divided into several districts. You see it at the bottom left of the slide. But when we begin to, uh, to map each and every family, a task done by our members, and as I said, will, be, will serve for uh, tomorrow's lecture, the, the picture becomes blurred. It seems that the actual reality is smaller nuclear families belonging to different clans lived side by side, as it been, can be seen by the colors on the map presented. It seems that as if the principle of clustering was guiding, but was not really strictly followed. Also, this aerial picture of the village shows that the, that the division into the sector wasn't as clear cut as the British maps expresses it. The village houses agglomerated much closer. It feels as if the surveyor stood at the center of the village 
And the local representative started telling them, you see the house here and the road uh, down the slope? Uh, okay, so from here downward, it belongs to us, the uh, uh, kitabs. And from there, it belongs to somebody else, okay? and so and so. The final product was a cartographic expression of the social order, something that was vividly clear to the surveyors and the residents of the village, but not really observable by someone with no inside information. The typical layout of the house that were built in the late 19th, early 20th century is also an expression of the clan and Hamula's role in forming social and economic structures. None of the houses at Kalunia were left standing, and so we had to move to the neighboring village of Lifta, that was mentioned by Uzi, in order to envision complete houses and their layout. An internet published survey done by the Israeli Antiquity Authority allows us to do just that, and you have the link and you're all welcome to go there. There are a number of houses, house types in the village, but the one dated to the earlier part of the 20th century included a courtyard leading into a few houses that were then divided into several units. It is clear that a cluster of houses like that, that one that you see now, served for the extended family and not a nuclear family. It both allowed the family to act together economically and socially, and at the same time, imprint the value of the family for future generations. We can learn just how the house and the values that it represents were important for the social fabric of the village from viewing one of the main ceremonies conducted at the village the celebrations of take, taking place when a roof of a new house was built. This part of the research was conducted by Noah Ratzner that I saw joining us earlier, a PhD student involved in the project. This habit of celebrating the construction of the roof was documented in many literate sources, including the primary sources describing the events at Kalunia. But I will use here the description written by Taufik Kenan, a physician, an advocate, author, and a scholar born in Bejala in 1882, and then he lived in Jerusalem. So he's not exactly a peasant, but he, he's coming from there. According to these descriptions, the rooftops were usually vaulted, made of stones in cross-like form, and based on thick walls. The building of the house was done by the owner themselves and other relatives and, other, and friends from the village. They worked, supervised, and employed the workers. The mason, called the Ma'alem or Mu'alem Bana, was one of the uh, one to make the plans and to build the, the house. The Ma'alem gave inst the instructions. Once the procedure of the building of the house was done, before the roof was placed, the people of the neighborhood, both men and women, turned into, the, into and help with the building of the roof under the supervision of the main builder. It consisted in, it consisted of practical help, but also in singing and shouting. Kanan explains that as it is best built, uh, it is best to build the vault quickly in order that the stones may lock together and, and set in firmly in a short time, all friends and relatives of the owner of the house came to help. Men, women, and boys seem busily active. Some carried akads, or rather a man on the floor throws such, such a stone to another who stands on a ladder, and this is this to a third on the roof. Thus the Akkad are seen flying continually from one hand to the other. During the whole work, they, hear, they are heard singing joyfully. In their songs, they are praising the, the hospitality of the master of the house, the cleverness of the Ma'alem, and the readiness of the inhabitants of the village to help. During the building of the house, the women were responsible for preparing the food. And when the work was done, the workers headed to, and to take part in the feast. The importance of this ceremony for bringing together the larger family becomes even more vivid when one looks at the list of professions held by the people living in the village in Kalunia. Apparently, many of them were prof professional workers building houses in Jerusalem, where such ceremonies did not take place anymore. Okay, so we're talking about the early 20th century. They knew how to build a roof quickly and professionally without the hustle and the bustle. But still, the bonding ceremony helped preserve tradition that in turn helped, kept, helped keeping, keeping the, the village integrity, uh, in, integrated socially. Another threat to the ceremony was the introduction of cement roofs. Apparently, this technological innovation had made the passing of stone from one hand to the other redundant. But that's not where its effects ended. It also allowed the construction of houses in, in a very few 
uh, in a very new layout. Coming back to Lifta, we can see that the houses that were built of one independent unit positioned like train cars, one after the other. Okay? And these houses were built in the late 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century. These kind of houses were built in the 1940s and we, we have documentations of such houses also in Kalunia, as you, as you will learn from Shoakis Levitz's lecture tomorrow. They seem to be serving as residents for a nuclear family detached in its everyday tasks from the extended family. Hence, the introduction of cement and other building materials such as roof tiles placed, pressures, press, placed pressure on the concept of family as an order parameter and it may be the reason behind the spread of families into sectors, declaratively at least, that were associated with other clans. Can it be that Sumerin describes the, an ideal realia that by the middle of the 40th, uh, 1940s had changed? And what are the reasons for these changes? For that, I have to quickly introduce another aspect of integration, and that is the economic structure of the village. As I noted, quoted at the start of this lecture, we should view economy and society together as one. Until now, we spoke about the role of family ties in forming social integration, but documents relating to the economic administration reveal before us land ownership, that land ownership was also shared between members of the clan and sometimes even members of other clans. This aspect will also be dealt with in, uh, I think was dealt, uh, a little bit dealt with in uh, most lectures, uh, and uh, there is a, le a lecture about that in the, in, in the session behind, after me. Uh, the Musha system that stands behind that is in its most basic concepts, and I hope not to irrigate uh, you, Amos, speaks of sharing uh, uh, land ownership and sharing costs and sharing products, something like that, profits, okay. sharing. It's another indication that the basic economic unit was not a single nuclear family. Instead, just as the traditional village house plans show, and just as the ceremonies helped maintain through time, it was the wider family that serves, served as the economic unit. However, the, Shuma, the Musha economic system with its internal social logic was deemed irrational by administrators representing the British Empire. They demanded change and pressured for land registration that differentiated between individuals, by that breaking down traditional alliances. Not only that, as was noted before, many of the people living in Colonia were working in house construction in, developing, in the developing city of Jerusalem. These guys brought home individual salaries detached from the complicated and resilient agricultural system. In fact, calculations made by our, made by our team show that many of the village residents by the 14th and 1940s were employed as policemen, bus drivers, postmen, and so on and on. These jobs promised economic individuality. What is the role of the wider family in such economic reality? I'm not sure I can answer that, and I'm not sure that they knew how to answer that. In sum, it seems that the very fundamental forces that shaped and facilitated life, facilitated life, be them social or economic, which for me, they are really the same, in a village society uh, were placed under pressure by modern and social, social and economic policies that were followed by technological innovations. While Sumerin describes in his book a society that is well integrated socially and economically with the metaphor of the clan and the family as the most basic order parameter, ch changes taking place in his childhood already allowed people to earn, in the, earn individual wealth, to build houses that were better served this individuality and move out of the extended family cluster. These changes were, changes were already in motion and are therefore reflected in the village material culture. The fact that the land were still registered under many names and that most of the people were still living in their larger family clusters shows that the integration was still in play and the very basic metaphor kept the village integrated and alive. And as I said, there will be more tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Yuval. It was absolutely fascinating. It's lovely the way that all the lectures entered into dialogue with each other. And I'm sure that you would like to continue some of the dialogue and have comments and questions. Congratulations to all the speakers. Anybody would like to comment, add? You can unmute yourselves, ask a question or write it on the chat.
No one? Someone has to talk. Go ahead, Amos. <laughs> the, the first one is always the hardest. Yes, yes. I have something to ask, like the three of you. In fact, you've mentioned a point of view and, and, and policies, uh, specifically in, uh, in Uzi and uh, Beatrice uh, uh, lecture, it was the policies of Israel towards the remains. And then Yuval also got to that and, and, and said, in fact, that we are digging or people, we have evidence in Kalunia and, and so on. And the question that I have is, to what extent you feel that, in fact, we or our research is influenced by these constraints or you know, support uh, uh, while uh, researching uh, archaeology and history together. Who would like to go first? Beatrice. Uh, I don't think that my restrictions are to the policies of Israel. It's the policies of every ruling group that came through from the beginning to the modern day. And I think those policies need to be examined in in how monuments are affected or how the culture was affected. Um, for example, for the seventh century, we have the people who came with the conquerors were from Yemen and the building construction methods are heavily affected by those Yemeni builders. And uh, that's why the seventh century has meant a lot to me because I've been embroiled in this site <laughs> for 30 years trying to accomplish my research. Uh, from one side or the other, I was receiving problems. Ultimately, I received permission from the Al-Kaf in Amman to work in writing, and yet the Al-Kaf in Jerusalem did not allow me to work. <laughs> so, um, you know, it is the policies of governmental organizations that dictate uh, possible research, etc., and the building of structures and the dictates on cities and villages. Yeah, I'll add to, to Beatrice's uh, excellent comment. Uh, my own training was influenced by Mark Leone in historical archeology span and uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. And what Leone started pushing in the 1980s uh, was really trying to bring in critical theory, the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, and trying to really understand how much of what we do as researchers, uh, you know, supports particular interests. And for Leone, his decision was to stay in Annapolis for really his entire career. So his, uh, he has a book on 25 years of research in Annapolis. He's done more since then, but really honing in on all those little details to see how what Foucault would call governmentality plays out. And that's where Patrice's comment is quite correct. It has not, doesn't have that much to do with the state of Israel per se. Every state, any government, and part of what I find complicated and interesting is that shift in the Ottoman Empire as it was modernizing. Not modernizing as coming into the contemporary, but following the models from Western Europe and the United States to try to control its people, its territory by finding precision. You've all showed it just wonderfully. I mean, I could not have uh, imagined a better example. And as that occurs, we're looking and we have a choice of looking at the result of it or opening it up. And opening up is just a wonderful challenge. And I think because of my archeological training, I do what Jim Dietz says, let's see what people are actually doing. And for Israel, it's in every direction. There's both preservation and destruction. There's both remembering and forgetting. Uh, that's how contemporary states work. Yeah. And the more we understand, the more we can be efficient and effective in our research. And I'll just add that, I don't know, like we need somebody from the outside maybe to analyze that, but the fact is that the Israel Antiquities Authority, which is a government uh, organization, legally uh, now excavates more Othman period or even 20th century period sites than anybody else. I, I don't, I, like there are 
two or three examples of initiated excavations, but ongoing excavations with data being collected. It's the Israelis Antiquity Authority who are leading the, the show. Yeah. And um, I can assure you from the outside, uh, that's not well known at all. Yeah. <laughs> the, the assumption is, you know, what I could state was the case in the 1990s, right? the early 1990s, I should stress, right? That it was ignored for the most part, but that shifted. Right? Yeah. It was a, a large number of people who worked to say, no, no, let's be good scientists, let's recover everything. And the Rashid, Rashid does that. I think the next step is, as I try to lay out, not just the collection of material, but that, you know, that is the primary responsibility, no question. Are there those grad students, graduate students who are willing to kind of pull things together, to look at it both chronologically and spatially? And is there support for that? And I think this conference is basically an argument of support for that sort of agenda. Let's look at this on the real large scale. And I think at this point, there is enough data available from various uh, parts of the country to actually pull things, really interesting questions together. And I think as your work shows, it's actually going to open up the issues for other places around the world. I would also say that in um, affirming what Uzi has said about past scholarship in the field that I've been working in, it has been totally reliant on Western scholarship up until the last 30 years, I would say. And even my advisor at Harvard, Oleg Rabar, you know, Mr. Islamic Art, uh, once wrote that there was no architectural tradition brought with the Arabs. There was no architectural tradition. They lived in tents. What did they bring with them? That clearly has been rewritten. And my time living in Israel, and I did live there for three years consecutively in the early 90s, you know, pushed me into archaeology and I did excavate. So I'm kind of half art historian, half archaeologist at this point. <laughs> But archaeology has has opened the eyes, I think, to scholarship as well. I think that also you you Val just mentioned, like that there is a gap between the official policy or the official uh, way that Israel is being perceived versus the practical act on the ground by the archaeologists that specifically exist in specific sites, that walk in specific sites. Any other comments, questions, reflections? I, I just wanted to add something. Um, it's sort of a question and a reflection. Um, I get to embarrass Uzi a little bit because I'm a former student of his um, and actually came to Israel due to his encouragement to study Ottoman work. Um, and so I came here in 2012 and I ended up in historic preservation here because at that time that was really my only uh, route to do the Ottoman work because it was still, there was uh, a couple archaeologists, one in Jaffa and the others in Akka where I was. Uh, doing archaeology of the Ottoman Empire, but there just wasn't any support. So I've seen a lot of the tensions of that uh, uh, concept of, you know, uh, it's all around us. I live in Haifa. Ottoman heritage is all around us, especially up here in the north, but also Jerusalem. Jaffa, it's inescapable, but to have that act of forgetting for a long time as part of even official or unofficial policy. Uh, but over that time, I've been able to see, oh, there's been this explosion in it, which has been really encouraging. So now I'm firmly on another path, so not doing so much digging anymore. Um, but my other question would be more relating to the historic preservation, because it's so uh, disparate, depending on the locality. Jerusalem, it's very strict, but a typical, uh, very uh, Jewish-centric, um, strict in many ways. Tel Aviv's different. Akka, where most of my work is, is probably the next most developed in the country after uh, those. And then Haifa is like its own wild west. Um, but how has, you know, in your experience, this act of historic preservation where you end up with what are the Fellahin homes or the peasant homes ending up uh, becoming sort of these boutique uh, uh, bread and bed and breakfasts or reusing in a completely 
different manner than what it was historically. Thank you for your question. Yes. I'll, I'll go first. Uh, it's a it's it's a complicated issue because it's also it's it, it goes into the economy and uh, the capitalization of the past. Can I say something like that? Uh, everything has to earn money now. I, I, it doesn't have the right to exist. Uh, and so you're right that the, there is more, let's say, there, there is more uh, place given to Jewish heritage, but in, in a sense, also places that are connected to the Jewish heritage, if there's no, if there's no funding and it doesn't produce income, then uh, they are neglected in, in the same way. I live in Modi'in, something like 10 minutes away from my house, a synagogue that can be related to, uh, uh, we just celebrated Hanukkah, uh, to the Maccabees, can be, you know, it, you can do this association, but it's standing there full of grass above it and so mm -hmm. on. So, so it's, I think it's more about the very, very post-capitalist uh, or no, neoliberalist, neoliberalism mm -hmm. policy that is affecting everything. This is my two cents on the subject. No, I think you're, you're quite right, right? And again, I, I think it's uh, important, and I get this from black feminist thoughts, right? We don't want to ignore the presence. I think, you know, my, the training in archeology span used to be, and probably the majority still is, uh, kind of the romance of a past period of time. And we can have that romance, not just for the Bronze Age or the Hellenistic age, we can also have it for the early 20th century, right? That's one of the concerns, as, you, as you've uh, pointed out, you can romanticize peasant life. And in fact, in Americanist and historical archeology, span there was a tremendous romanticization that occurred. All these low towns in New England were excavated as kind of these wonderful, peaceful, beautiful places. Uh, anyone who's uh, studied peasants any depth, they've read novels about peasants, peasants don't get along that well. I mean, James C. Scott as well is wonderful at laying out the real tensions, right? And uh, again, I think in a much larger theoretical discussion, uh, I, I, I said the word gender twice. I think I was the only one who said gender so far in this conference. Right? The, the issues between men and women uh, have to be considered. Uh, we have a sense of the different clans, the kinship dynamics, I uh, think, so you all, but even more so those, uh, of course, there's just different notions of identities for occupation and uh, places. And we know people travel. I think you know, Patrice's uh, presentation was uh, really important. Uh, people went to pray and they saw those mosaics, not the ones today. They did not see the dome that was recently built. Uh, if we pretend that, if we don't make those connections, we have a real misconception of how people in various time periods lived. It's a much larger endeavor, but we don't start just in those periods, but we start with today. And as you've all laid out, you know, I published an edited volume in 2004 with Lior Rowan on uh, the marketing of the past. Uh, it's only accelerated that neoliberal heritage tourism that affects what's preserved and what isn't, what's highlighted. We start that layer, and then we move through the different layers and the more we do that uh, reverse chronology, the more I think we can illuminate the changes and not unthinkingly impose the present on the past. We're still gonna impose the present on the past. We have no real choice, uh, but at least do it with a little more clarity. I would also say that our work on the seventh century, um, focusing on the monuments and the entire Haram al-Sharif, the monuments tell us what the site was used for, um, because what we're saying occurred in the seventh century under Muawiyah was that the site was open to everybody and that the triple gate allowed people to go into the mosque if they turned to the right, but Christians and Jews were allowed to go up and pray on the site um, that way. And it's the, it's the dictates of the site itself that give you the, the answers if you're willing to look at them not in light of past scholarship. I think that's one of the guiding things that, you know, being projected back to the seventh century after working on the 20th century <laughs> yeah. has allowed me to do. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Amos, if you can unmute yourself, sorry. 
if no one no one takes takes it so, so I, I'll take it just for a for a comment. Uh, one comment is like I see Uzi <laughs> Uzi mentioned Scott and then kind of hesitately because of our discussion before saying poop he was right and then and Scott was wrong. So I think that uh, Scott is very relevant to to the study when we speak about uh, uh, why people are trying to to work together, how it persists, like he would call it moral economy. And I think that last night, in fact, we saw a kind of a shift of Pupkin versus Scott, while uh, Pupkin said, yes, yeah, there is something in what uh, uh, Scott said. And in fact, we are not enemies or whatever, because we, we studied it totally differently. But I think that what we have uh, uh, from that discussion and from the discussion here uh, to take is to remember that both are relevant for you. But I think the, 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 the thing that we, like the economic historians, really uh, kind of were very angry about Scott is not about all the umbrella that he discusses, but specifically saying that because the peasants um, are too poor, they are not taking risks, they are not trying to maximize. They, he would they tell that they are uh, afraid of the market. And what we see is high integration in the market. So I'm saying, like, uh, like we said before, theories are good servants, but bad masters. We can use both theories together without hesitation, but remember the advantages and disadvantages. And the, the other thing to add is to what you Val just uh, 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 explained about Calunia, and I think that what was very interesting for me is to study or to learn from the archaeology to analyze the way that people connect in a house, like um, how you call it, the access analysis, that you would see what is connected and what is not, not connected, to look for the kitchens, and then to understand how society really operated without any written document on the specific family. And I think that what we can see from micro studies, like in, in the study of Calunia, is to really understand the gaps that exist in the text. Because in the text, the most, uh, 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 the normal discussion is about households, small households, and that's it. But then you would see, especially in memoirs, that the household, is definitely not the only unit. And if you would go to, uh, th there is a very interesting uh, uh, research, anthropo anthropological research of the 1920s in uh, Bismejin in uh, North uh, Lebanon. And someone wrote a PhD about his village. And then you understand that what we call, or the British call, though we still call it the household, it's just one unit that connected so much socially, economically, politically to other units that we cannot really segregate them. And as Yuval said, we cannot really segregate between economics and society and politics. It's a overall, so it's good that everyone has his own expertise, but eventually this is what we are trying to do, to connect between scholars with different backgrounds and to make something together that brings other aspects that we didn't think about it. And this is an example. That's it. Thank you, Amos. I think that really is a is an excellent summarizing comment uh, for for the session. Obviously it ties in with your discussion before and I'm sure that you will continue the uh, the discussion and similar threads in uh, in the next sessions so i think we can close this session for now